Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this service from Holy Trinity Church, Red Hill. In just a moment, we're going to sing our opening song, The Splendour of the King. But before we begin our worship, and so that we uh, sing with our hearts and minds engaged, let me read to you a few verses from Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook and the temple was filled with smoke. We have a mighty and holy and awesome God. Those who see him, those who are in his presence, cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Let's join our praises now with theirs as we sing together the splendour of the King, how great is our God.
sound good. Don't we'll see how great, how great is sound When Isaiah sees the Lord in that vision, his first response isn't to cry out in praise. It's to cry out in fear because he sees the holiness and the splendor of Jesus. And he knows that he and the people that he lives among are unholy. Listen to these words. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined for I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. It's a strange phrase, unclean lips, but Isaiah is saying we've spoken wrongly about God. We've given praise to wrong things. We've not spoken truth to one another. God is holy and we are sinful. Let's take a moment now to bring before God our own individual need uh, to say sorry to him for the way that we fail to live for him in ways that are pleasing to him, for the ways that we've failed perhaps to speak about him or witness to him in the world. Let's bow our heads and uh, in a moment we'll say together these words that will now appear on the screen. O King, enthroned on high, filling the earth with your glory, holy is your name. Lord God Almighty, in our sinfulness we cry to you to take our guilt away and to cleanse our lips to speak your word through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And wonderfully, look what happens next. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from the tongues from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. Purified, cleansed, forgiven. Jesus is the one who can take away our guilt and take on himself as he goes to the cross the guilt and the burden of our sin so that we might be freed from it. Isn't that wonderful news? We're restored to friendship with the Holy God, with this great and splendid Saviour, Jesus. But the story doesn't end there. Verse 8 then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? In other words, who will go and tell this world about this holy God? And Isaiah responds, Here am I. Send me. Is that your response? Lord, thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for setting me free. Here I am to live for you. That's the right response. We're going to sing together now our next song. We want to see Jesus lifted high, a banner that flies across the land. Let's sing together. We want to see Jesus lifted high. Thank you. 
wanna see, we wanna see Jesus live in life. We wanna see, we wanna see, we wanna see Jesus live in life. Step by step, we're moving forward. Little by little, taking ground. Little by little, powerful weapon. Strongholds come tumbling down. Well, it's been 20 years since I last put on a St Bede's school uniform and this September students across the UK are going to be putting their school uniforms back on for the very first time in months and things are going to be a bit different and there are many mixed feelings about that, mixed emotions, concerns, excitements and so Dave and I are going to be running a session called Bubbling Back to School. And we're going to be doing it on Zoom on Tuesday, the 1st of September at 8 o'clock in the evening. And it's a chance for parents to think through and talk about um, ways that we can encourage and support and help our children and our young people at this time. We'll be looking at some biblical principles and also some practical advice and tips about how we can best support them at this time. So that's on Tuesday the 1st of September at 8pm in the evening and if you'd like to join us then please do email me on lizzie at htredhill.com. We would love you to join us if you can. Hi, good morning. Um, I'm joined this morning by Claire and Fran um, who have joined the summer sessions this week. So we're just going to hear a little bit about um, what's been happening um, and the fun stuff that's gone on this week. Um, so firstly, I'm going to get um, the ladies just to introduce themselves um, and to say what service they come to. Um, so Claire? I'm Claire Tate. I uh, come to the 10 o'clock service with my husband Brian and my three children, Megan, Joshua and Bethany. And I'm Fran Davis and with my husband Gary and our son Thomas, who's age nine, uh, we also go to the 10 o'clock service. Thank you. So we're just going to ask a few questions about the week and how it's gone. Um, we've, if you've looked at the beginning of the um, service, there's been some photos um, which have included um, what the children have done, which look fantastic. Um, so firstly, what's been the highlight of your week, Fran? So um, we've really enjoyed all the songs. We've really enjoyed uh, the different songs, some new songs, uh, some favourite songs from past um, holiday uh, camps. We've really enjoyed um, day, uh, uh, Dave with his actions and then we can then follow them and we've had lots of really jubilant loud raucous singing in our house and it's been really fun to do with Thomas and I we met with Claire and her kids yesterday there's lots and lots of singing that we've enjoyed that's been a real highlight great yeah I'd echo that lots of dancing around the room and uh, lots of twirling and singing that's been really good fun and um, but also the crafts my lot have really enjoyed um, first watching on the YouTube and then afterwards looking in their goodie bag of bits that were given to us before and oh, what's the craft today and you know have we got all the bits and and really really enjoying those great and, and what sort of impact has it on had on you as a family as you've gone through the week listening to the stories um, which have been great it's been lovely to see um, what how has it impacted you as a family um, Claire um, so I would say the, the prayer sessions have actually been really helpful for us as a family, um, particularly Megan, who's nine and that bit older and able to understand it a bit more. Um, so, for example, on I think it was Monday, they made a, a prayer box and they had to put in it all the as, uh, aspects of um, God's character. And then you chose three of those and then used that to do a prayer of praise to God. And that really showed Megan 
a different way of praying that she hadn't really thought of before. And she was able to say a beautiful prayer after that session, using that box as a prompt. Um, and Josh, um, on another day, they were encouraged to think about people they may pray for. And they had to think of someone bigger than them, smaller than them, people they've never seen before. Um, various other things and then something they want to pray for themselves and again he really appreciated that and it got him thinking about how and who he could pray for so for us the the, the prayer has has really helped as a family that's great and fran uh, we do have like the prayer and the pac and obviously we're going on to tea and we've used that at our nighttime prayers and thomas constructed a very special prayer last night but what we've also really enjoyed is learning more about elisha so how Caroline reads the uh, scripture and also the Duplo um, figures that really adds the visual elements to it. And Thomas has really, and I have been both um, capt captivated by those pictures. And then just thinking about what prophet means and about how Elisha was the word of God and, and then relating it back to Jesus and, and all the overlapping messages. So you get the, the scripture from Caroline and the pictures, you then get Dave um, explaining more about it. And then you get related back to your own life as well. And so that's really broadened Thomas's and mine um, understanding about Elisha and also about how God works through Elisha and also through us and the Holy Spirit at nowadays. That's great. That's such a great impact um, on your week. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, has it, interestingly, has it erased any questions um, from your little ones that have maybe challenged you a little? <laughs> um, <laughs> Claire, we'll go to you first. Yeah. So we had we, we had quite a funny a funny one. So Megan, well and Josh, but Megan particularly was quite taken with the fact that Elijah didn't actually die; that he was taken up to heaven on a chariot of fire, and um, this sort of sparked an interest in Megan and she said oh well I think I'd like to do that I think I'd like to just go up to heaven on charity fire I don't want to die so it, it started a very interesting conversation on how actually he's the only one in the bible that's done that and that the only other sort of equivalent was was Jesus who died first but then went up to heaven after he had uh, risen again so um it, it that was that was more of a funny question um but equally a question that that came up through it so yeah I think Thomas has just been struck by leprosy and what a debilitating disease it was. And then it, now that we've said, well, it doesn't exist anymore, or, well, you, there's medications, so you don't have to be separate, separated. Uh, he was really the thought about that and how hard it was for Naaman and obviously Jesus healing the 10 lepers as well. So there's just been a, a, a conversation and questions about that and just understanding about how different it would have been if you had leprosy uh, in that society and how you couldn't have done anything. You couldn't have been with your family, couldn't have been with your friends. And obviously Thomas being such a social boy, he, that, that pained him that people could not be with their friends and their family. So yeah, we've had discussions about leprosy. That's great. And finally, um, there's been lots of craft um, and all been given to us in our packs, which has been fantastic. Um, what has been your favourite craft? And is there anything else you'd like to say just to uh, finish up? Um, Fran, if you'd like to go first. So um, we've liked all the different crafts. There's been something very, very different every single day. But we were the Tates yesterday. Our, the, the, our kids are very close friends. We're very close friends as well with, with um, Claire and Brian. And so the um, cooking in particular and doing it with friends was very nice. And that social element of the holiday club, which every year has seen hundreds of children and or tens of children and all the staff um, all being together at the church centre has been lovely. And Thomas is our only child, so it's just him and me doing it. So it's just been a bit quieter this year. So the different craft has been amazing. He loved the cooking yesterday because he likes eating biscuits. So the, the craft in particular. And the thank you is just, um, we understand how much everybody's been working behind the scenes to put together an amazing summer holiday sessions, you know, with so many different people that we've seen on the screen. And that's really added to... Um, the depth of understanding, the depth of learning about Elisha, but there's, there'll be so many people that we haven't seen behind the scenes helping. So we just want to say a big thank you to, to everybody at church that's put it together. It's been a very special part of our week and um, this week. Thank you. Um, and Claire? I'd have to echo the biscuits. My children are currently sitting downstairs eating um, the ones we, some of the ones we made <laughs> yesterday. So the biscuits were a big hit. Um, they did really enjoy making the chariots of fire as well. They, I think that was another, another highlight. Um, and yeah, just to echo uh, Fran's thanks to everyone that's been involved. It's, uh, you can see the amount of work that's gone into it and the children have been so engaged all week. So thank you if you were involved behind the scenes on the on the camera thank you for doing it it has really had a good impact on our family so thank you 
That's great. Um, thank you so much for joining me this morning um, and for sharing with us um, about how your week's been. Um, that's great. Thank you very much, ladies. It's yeah. a pleasure. Thank you. We're now going to hear our Bible reading from Acts chapter 9, and that's read to us by Sue Field. And then Sarah Alexander will come and speak to us from that passage. As Peter travelled about the country, he went to visit the Lord's people who lived in Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas, who was paralysed and had been bedridden for eight years. Aeneas, Peter said to him, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and roll up your mat. Immediately, Aeneas got up. All those who lived in Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek, her name is Dorcas. She was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time, she became ill and died, and her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Lydda was near Joppa, so when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lydda, they sent two men to him and urged him, Please, come at once. Peter went with them, and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. All the widows stood around him, crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and prayed. Turning towards the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes and seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. Then he called for the believers, especially the widows, and presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. It's true to say, isn't it, that we live in a time in history when communication is better and faster than it has ever been. Just think about it. We get emails 24-7. We can be in touch with people on the opposite side of the world at the touch of a button and not just hear them, but see them at the same time. If something important happens in the world, well, it flashes up as a notification on the phones that we have in our pockets. News is instant. Communication is an easy thing for us. News is easy to spread. Well, today we're beginning a new sermon series looking at the book of Acts. It's a really exciting series following the early church, how the communication about Jesus, all that he'd said and done, happened. How the church grew from a few witnesses to Jesus' death and resurrection, who saw what had happened, how they told all that they knew about him and how the church grew, the same church that if you and I are trusting Jesus today, are part of. And you will have noticed from our Bible reading that we're starting at Acts chapter 9 today. So let me catch us up with a very brief overview of what has happened before. In chapter 1, Jesus, after he has died and risen again, ascends to heaven. But before he does, he tells the disciples what is going to happen. Acts 1 verse 8. We've looked at this verse before in our online services. I preached on these verses at Pentecost and I'm going to show you the same slides I used on that day, not because I'm lazy, but because I think it might prompt us and remind us of the promises of Jesus. This is the verse you see, Acts 1 verse 8, that we see being outworked in the rest of the book. Acts 1, 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That's a promise of Jesus, isn't it? That when he left them and went back up to heaven, God the Father would send the Holy Spirit to be with them, to help them to build the church. And of course, at Pentecost, in chapter 2 of Acts, the Holy Spirit was sent. And when he came, the, the disciples saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each one of them. 
Mick has called this series the spreading flame and I'm sure you can see the link. The Holy Spirit was given to the disciples to share the good news about Jesus and then they were to pass it on. Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit would come to enable them to be his witnesses, to tell other people about all that he had said and done. They would start this in Jerusalem, then go to the surrounding area of Judea, further afield to Samaria and then all the way to the ends of the earth. It's a ripple effect, isn't it? The spreading of the flame of the Spirit of God is given to each new believer as the communication of the gospel is spread. And person by person, many turn to Jesus. And in chapters 3 to 8 of Acts, we see three main things happening. Firstly, we see the disciples, empowered by the Spirit, preaching and teaching about Jesus in Jerusalem. And we see many people responding and coming to faith. Secondly, we see the early church beginning to shape and grow, to work out its priorities, to work out how to serve each other and for their local community. And thirdly, we see opposition beginning. We see disciples being arrested by the religious authorities, told to stop teaching about Jesus. We see Stephen, the first Christian martyr, killed. And in chapter 8, we're introduced to a man called Saul, who's committed to persecuting Christians. Let me read chapter 8, verse 2. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. That's interesting, isn't it? Even in the midst of persecution, the promise of Jesus being fulfilled about the Spirit well, persecution still takes place, but God uses it. God's people are now where? They're in Judea and Samaria, not just in Jerusalem. The church is growing. The flame is spreading. The good news about Jesus is being made known. Then in chapter 9, we see the incredible conversion of Saul on the road to Damascus. The persecutor of Christians becomes himself a follower of Jesus and then he starts speaking about Jesus himself. And in chapter 9, 31, we read these great words. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened. Living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in number. Now, I know that took a couple of minutes to do, but it does give us an idea about what's going on. You might want to read those early chapters of Acts through this week. It's a great thing to do. But for now, let's turn to our Bible reading for today. Acts chapter 9, verses 32 to 42. Here we're introduced to two people who are touched by the power of God, working through Peter, Peter, who was Jesus' closest friend. We read that Peter has been travelling and he arrived in a place called Lydda, which was about 25 miles away from Jerusalem. The gospel has already spread there. We can see that in verse 32. Peter has gone to visit the Lord's people who lived there. But while he was there, he meets a man called Aeneas. All we know about this man is that he has been bedridden for eight years because he's paralysed. But Peter says to him, Aeneas, Jesus heals you. Get up and roll up your mat. And amazingly, Aeneas got up. He was healed. But it doesn't stop there. Peter moved on. If we have a look at verse 38, we see why. Lydda was near Joppa, we read. So when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lydda, they sent two men to him at once and urged him, please come here. Joppa was a coastal town. It's about six or eight miles away from Lydda. And so Peter travels there as he's asked to. And why is he gone? Well, because of a woman called Tabitha, or in Greek, Dorcas, and she has died. So his friends, her friends, sorry, are imploring Peter to come. We know a bit more about her than we do about Aeneas. Firstly, Dorcas is a disciple, a follower of Jesus. 
We also find out that she was always doing good and serving the poor. Now, she wasn't a busybody. No, she's a faithful disciple. She served the Lord in Joppa. That's what she's remembered for. And it looks like she served the poor by sewing, doesn't it? She's a seamstress. If you have a look at verse 39, it says this, All the widows stood around him, that's Peter, crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas has made, had made when she was still with them. Now that might seem like a bit of an odd thing for Luke to record, but actually doesn't it just show us the humanity at the centre of all of this? A grieving group of people because their friend has died wants to show their visitor her work. They want to pay testament to her. And isn't that what we do? It's normal, isn't it? If I go to a funeral visit, quite often the family of someone that has died will want to tell me about their loved one. Maybe show me a painting they've done or a photograph they've taken or some embroidery that they finished. They'll want me to know more about them, what they've done in their lifetime. And so here, as these grieving people show Peter what Dorcas has done, well, they're wanting to pay testament to their friend, how faithful a disciple she was. But then this becomes far more than a funeral visit. Peter sends everyone, sent everyone out of the room and he prayed. And then he turned towards her and said, Tabitha, get up. And incredibly, she does. She was alive and Peter presents her to her friends alive once more. What an amazing day. Two people, two miracles, both done by Peter in the power of the Holy Spirit. The spreading flame of the good news of the gospel. The growth of the early church. So what are we to learn from these miracles? We can see that Peter, in his apostolic ministry, well, he's following the pattern of Jesus himself, isn't he? In Luke's Gospel, obviously written before Acts, Luke writes an account in chapter 5 when Jesus heals a paralysed man. He tells him to get up and walk, and the man does. In Luke chapter 8, verses 40 to 56, Luke tells us an account of when Jesus himself heals Jairus' daughter. Peter here is following the same pattern of Jesus, doing what Jesus had done, just as Jesus promised he would do. So can we simply say then that if we're followers of Jesus, if we're filled with the Spirit, then we must follow Peter's example and do the same. After all, the flame of the Spirit that was at work in Peter has spread to us over 2,000 years later and over 3,000 miles away from Jerusalem. Well, I don't deny that God can heal and act today. Of course he can. He's God. He can do what he wants. But these kind of healings and raising from the dead don't happen very often, even in scripture. Even Jesus only raised someone back to life three times in his whole ministry. You see, it's important for us, isn't it, to, yes, let's be expectant of what God can and might do today. But we also need to have right expectations, don't we? If this isn't normative, then what have these verses got to teach you and me? Well, firstly, let's look at the apparent differences between these two miracles. Aeneas was paralysed. He could do nothing to be worthy of receiving this gift of healing. He'd done nothing to deserve it for eight years. He was bedbound. His healing was purely and simply a gift from God through Peter in the power of the Spirit. Dorcas, or Tabitha, on the other hand, was someone who was known for putting her faith into action. Maybe we've got lots to learn from her about putting our faith into practice, caring for the poor and doing good, but that's another sermon for another time. But she had died. Like Aeneas, she could do nothing to change her state. Both the healing of Aeneas and the raising of Dorcas were gifts from God. Yes, through his servant Peter in the power of the Spirit, but it was nothing that they had done to deserve it or earn it. 
One of my favourite passages in the Bible is from Ephesians chapter 2. I'm just going to read some of those verses to you. They'll come up on the screen now. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. They are wonderful words, aren't they? Great verses that point us to the glorious truth that our salvation is a gift from God. It's all about grace. Just like Aeneas and Dorcas were helpless, so are we without Jesus. We can't do anything to earn salvation. We can't do anything to make ourselves worthy of it. We don't need to strive after it. No, it's all a gift. It is Jesus that has done it all. It is him who has taken the punishment we deserve on his shoulders on the cross. It is Jesus that has paid the price. It is Jesus that has won for us forgiveness. It is Jesus and Jesus alone that gives us hope. You know, Aeneas and Dorcas, they did receive healing. Dorcas was raised to life for a time, but one day, and we don't know when, both of them died. That we can be sure of. But because of Jesus, you and I can have hope, eternal hope. So friends, let's be thankful, deeply thankful for this gift of grace that is yours and mine through Jesus. We are saved by grace alone. But there's another similarity back in Acts chapter 9. Have a look at what happens after the healing of Aeneas. Verse 35 says this, All those who lived in Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. And then look at what happens after the raising of Dorcas. This became known all over Joppa and many people believed in the Lord. The result of both of these miracles wasn't that Aeneas and Dorcas were venerated somehow or that Peter was praised because of the amazing things that he could do. No, the result was that many people came to faith in Jesus and the church grew. The spreading of the flame of the spirit, the words and works of God were made known and the church grew. You know, on the 21st of June each year, my diary on my phone tells me that it's my birthday. And every year it comes as a surprise. My actual birth date is the 13th of May. So why have I put a reminder on my phone for the 21st of June? Well, it reminds me of the date that I turned to Jesus and received new life in him. And it makes me deeply thankful every year. This year, I was 31 Christian years old. You know, that simple reminder on my phone makes me thankful. Thankful for the gift of grace that God has given to me. Thankful for his gift of salvation. Not because of anything I have done, but because of Jesus and all that he has done. But it also makes me deeply thankful for those who have handed on the baton of faith through the centuries. From Peter to Aeneas to Dorcas to the hundreds and thousands and millions of unnamed people, unnamed disciples who have done good, who have served Jesus, who have been faithful, who have shared the works and wonders of God, who've shared the story of salvation, of grace that's found in Jesus Christ, who have played their part, who have handed on the baton of faith person by person until the good news of grace reached me in 1989. So friends, let me encourage you to look back and remember and to ask, who's part of your faith story? Who passed on the stories of Jesus to you so that you could respond to him in faith? Why not look back, remember them and today be thankful for them? But don't stop there. Don't stop with being thankful for them. But turn that into a prayer for yourself. Pray that you too might join in, be part of that same story, 
the spreading of the flame of the Spirit of God, as you and I today share the offer, the invitation, the gift of grace, the gift of salvation that we are entrusted with to share with our generation, to share with those around us that the story of God might continue, that his church might continue to grow. Acts 1 verse 8, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your work in history. We thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you that we can receive your gift of grace through him and him alone. We thank you for those in our histories who have passed on the baton of faith to us, who have told us about his works of salvation. And we pray that we too, in our generation, might play our part, that we might make him known, that your church might grow and that he might receive the glory. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Mercy for on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a savior. The hope of nations. My God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save forever. Both through our salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. As you find me, oh my fears and failures, fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender. My God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save, forever, author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave, shine your light and let the whole world see, we're singing for the glory of the risen. Shine your light and let the whole world see We sing for the glory of the risen King the Savior, He can move the mountains My God is mighty to save He is mighty to save Forever, author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save, he is mighty to save. Forever, author of salvation. Heroes and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave. 
Almighty God, as we come before you in prayer, we consider the words written to the Corinthians. And now these three remain, faith, hope and love. But the greatest of these is love. Our prayers today will focus on these three areas. As we think of faith, Father, we recognise the confidence that the early church had in your almighty power, that you can change situations outside of our control, healing the sick and even bringing life to those who have died. We know that sometimes we struggle to have faith, that faith ourselves. We ask you to help us to come to you in confidence and faith at times of difficulty. Give us strength, we pray, when it feels that our prayers have gone unanswered for a long time, as Aeneas must have done. Lord, would you give us the faith to pray boldly, like Peter, trusting in your love. At this time of uncertainty, we ask you to bless us with the faith to trust that you are in control of all things. When our faith is weak, would you bless us with fellowship with other believers? Help us to seek out new ways to come together to encourage one another. We think of hope that is so badly needed at this time. Loving Lord, we thank you for your promises that those who hope in you will never be disappointed. We bring you our hopes for the future. Some of these personal to us, which we bring before you in our hearts now. For our church here at Holy Trinity, we bring you our hopes and plans for further services and times to worship you together. Thank you for our online services. Lord Jesus, may you help us in our homes to know the truth of your promise that whenever two or three are gathered together, you are there with us. For our nation, we bring you our hopes for schools reopening next week. We, bring, we pray for our politicians and head teachers who are still making decisions about how to do this safely. We pray for our pupils, teachers and other school staff who will be returning and ask that you give them patience and understanding with the changes they will find. We ask particularly that you will be with any who are anxious about returning. We pray too for your hope for those Christians around the world who are persecuted for their faith. Father, we know that you can work in amazing ways to provide for your people. And we ask that you would provide for your children at this time, where they may be unable to work, and where many of them may not be receiving the state and community support that others in their nation do. And the greatest of these is love. Father, you teach us that perfect love drives out all fear. We bring to you the racial tensions across our world, but particularly in America at this time. May you bless communities with love for one another that would drive out their fear of others. We pray particularly for leaders of communities that they would show a way of love for one another leading to peace and harmony. We pray for ourselves that we would reflect your love to others, particularly within our families, as we continue to spend more time than usual together. We pray for those who live in homes where they are lonely, afraid or struggling with less support from others at this time. We bring to you those we love, who we may not have seen as much recently, and those we have seen but grieve because we can't physically touch them to show our love. Strengthen our bonds, we pray, and help us to remember that through everything you love us and hold us in the palm of your hand. Father God, as Dorcas spent her time doing good and helping others, would you show us how we can practically help those around us? We ask all these things in the name of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. We began our service with that vision from Isaiah chapter 6, where those who are in the near presence of God, who see him as he is, couldn't help but proclaim and sing his praise. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We're going to do something similar now as we come to sing our final song. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. Let's sing together.
the dead receive new life the dead receive the mournful broken hearts rejoice the humble poor the humble poor brings us to the end of our service together uh, this morning but of course our worship and our witness continue as we're sent out into the world now to live and work for God's praise and glory. Can I encourage you with one uh, final uh, notice to complete the survey that was sent out by email this week. It's a survey that asks some questions about returning to the church building. It also looks ahead to Christmas. Um, don't be alarmed. Please do find time to complete that survey and send it back because it will help us. Uh, the information in it will help us greatly as we think about returning to our church building. Please do join us now uh, for coffee in our virtual coffee lounge. If you want to know uh, how to do that, then please send a quick email to rachel at htredhill.com and she will send you joining instructions. Let's close our time together with a prayer as we go out into the world. Father, help me to live this day to the full, being true to you in every way. Jesus, help me to give myself away to others, being kind to everyone I meet. Spirit, help me to love the lost, proclaiming Christ in all I do and say. Amen.
done, hallelujah. Jesus has won, hallelujah. We overcome, oh, in Jesus' name.